My name is Kim Adams. I am coming to you from Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and I am starting us off, I'm one of the conference organizers. Um, and this year we're focusing on how local contexts matter for humanities podcasting. So while podcasts can seem like a placeless medium, they are local in ways both obvious and subtle. So this year we're asking how the podcasts we make teach and consume connect to the places we live. We have four sessions approaching the local from different directions. The first, which you are in right now, is podcasting as scholarship, producing knowledge in your area, then podcasting pedagogies, soundscapes in the classroom, the craft of podcasts, making, distributing, and listening, and podcasts in the world, communities, industries, and social justice. Hi, I'm Milan. I'm also one of the organizers. Um, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Um, so each of these sessions is going to last for an hour in this Zoom room, all the same Zoom link throughout the day. The session leaders will begin the conversation on each topic and then open it up to all attendees for the second half of the session. So we encourage you to ask questions and share your insights and experiences. And we also ask that you keep yourself on mute until you're called upon and to be respectful of all the conference participants. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca and I'm the final conference organizer for this symposium. And if you haven't worked with us before, the Humanities Podcast Network is a collective of instructors, scholars, and independent creators dedicated to the transformative impact of audio media and the human voice. We work horizontally to empower people to make and use podcasts for education and scholarship. And you can check out our website and learn more at humanitiespodnetwork.org. So to be clear, the Zoom room will remain open between sessions. You might notice that there is a full hour in between if you wanna stay and chat. And for the first time ever, there is an in-person component to our symposium. There will be a meetup list that is dropped in the chat. You can check if there's a meetup in your area. We have um, several meetups in cities across North America and one in the UK. Today's sessions will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel for after the conference. If you don't want to be in the recording, just make sure to keep your audio and video off. Thank you for attending, and we look forward to hearing your voice. Now we hand it over to the session leaders. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, so I think it's uh, the two of us. Uh, I'm John Plotz, and to my I'm left. <laughs> And uh, together we run uh, a podcast. We are two of the co hosts of a podcast called Novel Dialogue, and we actually each have um, a podcast of our own as well. So we sort of came into doing that uh, podcast together out of, you know, individual experience of running what were also scholarly um, podcasts. And um, I don't know, Chris, do you want to start us off by talking about what it means to think of podcasting as scholarship or scholarship in podcasting? Sure. I, I mean, for me, I'm a, I'm a literary scholar. I work in, in the loosely understood field of world literatures and my um, experience with my own podcast, Burned by Books, and with the one that John and I um, run, uh, Novel Dialogue, is that um, it works as a kind of um, counter voice and counterfactual to the things that I study and, and think about. When you have authors in conversation with critics in a sound medium, you uh, enter um, a world of uh, uh, interaction with text that's very different, but um, intersective with the one that we think of as our own kind of uh, often solitary uh, interaction with authors and texts. So it can do disturbing things to one's scholarship, like to have, as, as John well knows, um, authors talk about how they reject theory or think about theory as antithetical to what art does, or they think of themselves as somehow apolitical when we often write about their work in, in distinctly political ways. But that can be deeply interesting and uh, evocative and produce wonderful questions uh, that can then change, grow, uh, and transform um, scholarship. 
So th that's just a kind of a tiny notion of how I've begun to think about how these things then come into writing, come into teaching, and come into other forms of scholarship. Yeah. And I'm going to, I think I'm going to start from the nerdy and arcane side. Um, you know, I, I uh, once read a book on the history of the footnote, so I do, my mind kind of runs that way. And I'll say that from the beginning with um, recall this book, we really took the show notes very seriously as a sort of citational space. And I don't think we do nearly as good a job as a lot of other um, podcasts do, but we do try to let it be a place where people can, um, follow out the tangents that are raised in the conversation. So that was sort of our first experience with thinking about like the scholarly ar arcana, I guess, of a podcast. And I feel like there's still more space to explore that. And if it's something that other people wanted to pick up, I would like to. And then also, I just wanted to say, because I doubt any of my sort of learned colleagues in their qualitative side are going to talk about this, but I thought I would talk about a sort of quantitative point, which is, I don't know how much people know about different ways that one can archive one's podcast. But, you know, I bet some of you have worked with your own, you know, local libraries or university libraries to do it. And Brandeis has actually been really good about that for both Recall This Book and for Novel Dialogue. But, um, but Chris and I and the Novel Dialogue team have also gone to the Humanities Commons. So I just dropped in a link for sort of a random, I think actually it's an episode of yours, Chris, where where the where the novelist is disagreeing with you about scholarship, but um, but this is a random episode in which we managed to deposit it at the Humanities Com Commons core repository, and that gives it um um a unique uh, oh, now I'm blanking on the name of what are the, Chris what are those electric uh, what what is the locator oh called? DOI no. DOI thank you it's a DOI so it was it's given a DOI it's actually slightly tricky because if you deposit in your own university library, they will often generate a dis different DOI and using a single DOI, getting a single DOI to describe a single podcast actually is not always straightforward, but it, we felt like it was better to have a DOI than to not have a DOI. So that's one aspect that I think about with the, the scholarship. It's basically something about referability. And I guess maybe along with that, I would just add really quickly that we also um, do transcripts, um, which was quite expensive, time consuming and meticulous work when we first started, but has gotten a lot easier now, thanks both to commercial services and things like using Microsoft Word to generate a rough mechanical transcript. And, you know, it has access accessibility implications, which is something we were thinking about from the beginning. But also, I don't know, you know, if you folks know people like other scholars who really just like to read things, they don't like to listen to things. And so that's so it's something to cite if people want to cite a line that's a scholar, a novelist said in the podcast, they can point to the transcript, which is a PDF that sits on our website or sits in humanities commons as well. Um, so yeah, that's another way that we think about just not trying to replicate the existence of other forms of scholarship, but but trying to make emphasize the facets of a podcast that do like you know, the way there's a real analogy to other forms of scholarship in terms of allowing the critical or scholarly conversation. And we've had, and I'll just add on the one thing to say that we've had at Novel Dialogue, several scholars at um, international institutions reach out to us about um, citation of, of podcast material. And I think as things like a single DOI reference number and a transcript exist, um, it becomes more recognizable as something that has rules and structures for, for use as scholarship and, and creates an ease and also, quite frankly, create something that um, uh, a college or university can use in evaluating faculty's scholarship, which I think is is really crucial. Yeah. And I think that's our five minutes. So thanks, you guys. Throwing Thank into you. the next alphabetical person, which I think is Destry. Destry, yeah. Yeah. Hi, all. Thank you for coming and being here from so many different places. This is very exciting. My name is Destry Sibley, and I'm calling in from the CUNY Graduate Center in New York, where I'm a doctoral candidate in English. And I've also worked for, I don't know, almost 10 years now as an independent podcast producer on the media side. I've worked for WNYC, Panoply, um, TED, a number of independent shows. And I now work for Magnificent Noise, which is a small boutique podcasting uh, company here in New York. Um, and I work on Esther Perel's shows with them. 
So for me, having straddled these two worlds, industry and um, academia, for a number of years now, for as long as I've been in graduate school, they felt um, so separate and intentionally so in a way. Um, I think on the industry side, um, the folks I work with in podcasting and radio think that the academic work I do is like a fun hobby. And um, on the academic side, I came into the program feeling a real pressure almost to keep the podcasting piece of my work um, seemingly more marginal than than it is for myself. I, I would say, oh, I just you know do it for extra money. And, and I felt that that's something that I needed to say because I feared that um, the faculty I was working with would think that I was less serious about my scholarship if I led on to how much work I did outside of academia. Um, until I had a radio piece air um, on the New Yorker radio hour and someone in my department circulated it, a faculty member circulated it, this was a few years ago. And my um, advisor in the program kind of scolded me and said, oh, I wish I had known more about this work that you do. This is so interesting and important. And um, I, I wish I hadn't learned about this from a colleague. And it um, really opened up for me, just that one comment, um, the possibilities and the level of support that there could be. So that's just a, a message for any uh, faculty members about um, how much it can mean uh, to hear that kind of encouragement. And that comment alone actually led me to apply for a Mellon ACLS Dissertation Innovation uh, Fellowship. So this year is the inaugural class of Dissertation Innovation Fellows from Mellon and ACLS. And I can put a link in the chat to that fellowship if anyone's interested. But I applied for that fellowship um, and was able to um, be awarded it with a proposal based on turning my dissertation research into a podcast. And so that's what I'm in the process of doing now. And it's incredibly exciting um, and a little nerve wracking, um, but it's afforded me this opportunity to think in really different ways about doing literary criticism or literary research um, in audio form. So I came into it thinking almost that the podcast would be ancillary to the dissertation research, that I would write the dissertation, a very traditional dissertation, you know, my little written chapters, and then I would, um, oh, thank you for saying that. Um, and then I would, you know, make a, um, a podcast episode based on each of the chapters say. And so that's what I set out to do with the first chapter, which has a lot of historical research. My um, dissertation research is on narratives of the maternal in contemporary literature and life writing in particular. Um, so it sent me into the archives looking at um, how Clinton and Reagan, for example, have constructed maternal narratives in their speeches um, with welfare reform, for example. So that felt a little more clear cut, but then I got to the second chapter and the second chapter is, which will, I suppose be a second episode as well, is a really close reading of one particular novel, this book Motherhood by Sheila Hetty, which came out in 2018. And the vast bulk of this chapter is um, pretty minute narratological analysis of Hetty's sentence structure, syntax, um, punctuation. And I was thinking, how am I ever going to translate this into an audio piece? But what I have discovered is that by taking this analysis and applying it to the audiobook, a whole other level of close reading is possible by hearing how these words are read, um, how they sound in our ears. And there's this beautiful opportunity to splice up the text as we hear it and, um, and register it on a different level, that there are new elements that come that emerge by hearing it rather than reading it. And so now what I'm discovering is that for this particular chapter, there's become a feedback loop where the um, written text of my dissertation has created the foundation for the analysis to bring to the audiobook. Um, but then the research based on the audiobook is coming back into the written text. And so there's um, the synchronicity between them, which I think is going to be really exciting for the project as a whole. Um, that is five minutes, so I'm gonna stop, but I am just so, like I mentioned, these worlds to me have felt so separate. And so it's just very exciting for me to see um, so many people here who are interested in bringing them together. So thank you for being here. And I'm not sure who's next. I think maybe Lisa. Yeah, okay, thank you all. Hi all. I'm really um, 
honored to be here to hear all about, uh, learn about all this exciting work. So I work together with Shruti and Le on a podcast called Immigrants Wake America. And Shruti and Le, do you want to introduce yourselves and maybe talk a bit about the podcast and I can jump in later? Yeah, um, uh, a group of us at Binghamton University, Professor Gyan, um, me and Leah and Marmin, who's another grad student, um, have started this podcast, Immigrants Wake America. I put a link in the web, uh, in the chat box here. Um, I, I am a fourth year PhD candidate in the English department. My dissertation is actually on 18th century British literature. I think about networks of race and caste in European enlightenment thought. Um, which uh, seems quite uh, unrelated to the podcast, but it's really not, I promise. Um, and Destry, I resonate with everything that you said um, about all of your experience. I've uh, I've also worked with the Binghamton University's IASH to build their public humanities podcast called Confluence Humanities in the Public Sphere. I've taught two courses on podcasting, um, summer courses for undergrads. Yeah, that's me. Um, hi, everyone. I am a PhD candidate in translation studies. Um, my dissertation focuses on the networks and politics of international film and international films and representation. And Professor Yin is my advisor. Um, also, my dissertation might sound irrelevant, but it's also related to the podcasting work, the archive that we've been working on. Um, yeah, that's about me. <laughs> Well, I am an associate professor at Binghamton and uh, in the Binghamton University in English department and in Asian and Asian American studies. Um, so I came to podcasting via my research on literatures of migration and immigration. Um, and this started with uh, my research on written and oral testimonial of the early Chinese in 19th century Cuba that was produced under a colonial regime. Um, so since then, I've been very interested in how subaltern voices are produced and could be heard um, in different forms. So Shruti and Lu, do you wanna tell everyone a little bit about what the podcast is? Yeah, um, we started the podcast, um, I guess we started releasing episodes in 2021, 2022. We started working on it if, like a year before that. Um, 2022 is when we started releasing episodes, which was our first season. It was supported by um, Humanity New York's Public Humanities Grant. We worked in partnership with the Tenement Museum in uh, New York. Um, one of the goals of our podcast was and is to have the audience reconsider the definition of immigrants and to think about their family's migration histories after listening to um, our episode so that that in turn may hopefully combat the prevalent anti-immigrant rhetoric. Um, and as a way to expand our project, we are now working on the second season of the podcast. Um, it's titled Hidden Heroes in a Small Town, Stories of Immigration and Belonging, which is supported by Humanities New York's Action, Action Grant. In these episodes, the staff from the ACA will share their personal stories and experiences of working to resettle refugees and immigrants in Broome County in Binghamton, New York. Notably, the majority of the ACA staff are immigrants themselves, some of whom um, just obtained their naturalized citizenship within the last few years. Um, they're they are like they have remarkable personal journeys across borders and cultures. This special season, um, in collaboration with both the Tenement Museum and the American Civic Association in Binghamton, will also include a digital educational supplement. Um, and this whole um, section will be made available to the public on the web for teaching, research, and community programs. I'll just uh, end our our description by talking a little bit about the challenges on methodology that we're wrestling with. Um, 
some of the questions we're asking ourselves in doing this uh, podcast is how could the podcast form help us to intervene in forms of epistemic injustice, particularly regarding immigrants and refugees? How could the podcast form lend itself, especially to research about and the elevation of marginalized voices? And two more questions, how to produce a kind of collaborative and accessible scholarship that can move across socially constructed borders? Um, and lastly, what might research field work look like for a podcast that is a collaboration with the local community? So these are just some challenges that we're working out. I believe my turn now. Uh, that's right. Yes, um, I share this enthusiasm that uh, the previous uh, fellow colleagues uh, expressed here, uh, and I'm perhaps the uh, the someone who doesn't have here a podcast uh, in English, uh, so I'm here as this this kind of marginalized uh, in terms of the language of the podcast, but I thought it was important uh, to participate since what we try to do here uh, in Brazil, where I am now, uh, is uh, a research uh, relating uh, the humanities and science communication. So I'm Gabriel Sid. Uh, I am on uh, I coordinate the culture, communication, and scientific. Um, communication sector at the Faculty of Education at the Federal University here in, in Rio de Janeiro. Actually, I'm not in Rio, but I am actually now uh, in a, uh, attending a symposium on social studies of science in Maceió, in the northeast uh, of Brazil. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to make a, a, a remix now of, of the activities so I am able to participate in here. And I thank you all for this opportunity. Uh, well, uh, actually, uh, uh, currently I am coordinating the sector at the Faculty of Education, uh, which aims culture and science communication. But my academic training uh, trajectory is, is quite, quite interdisciplinary, having come from philosophy with a master's degree and doctorate in uh, literature. Uh, and this trajectory is marked by the relationships between art and thought. And as a part of this interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary path, uh, uh, I have worked for 20 years in the sci uh, in science communication activities, uh, in the science communication scenario uh, with education uh, and science education, working in museums and cultural centers of science and technology here, uh, not here, but there in, uh, where I live in Rio de Janeiro. And since 2016, I'm at the Faculty of Education where uh, for the first time we started to think about uh, creating a podcast. So. That was a challenge. Uh, I'm a podcast enthusiast. And in Brazil, uh, as we were thinking about uh, setting up this podcast, well, we had a growing scene, uh, the huge increase in productions in 2019. It was considered a year of podcasts in Brazil, major uh, journalist uh, corporations uh, starting in the field. Uh, but we, uh, I'm uh, at the Faculty of Education, our team started out quite self-taught uh, as no one had a more uh, organic experience with the universe of sound and radio communication. Our idea was to create a program, uh, a podcast that contained several series uh, inspired by other podcasts uh, from universities here in Brazil. Uh, we wanted to have this program that contained several series each with an editorship and covering different topics at the interface between education and culture. So our podcast is called Radio Paideas. Paidea uh, is a Greek word for a classic definition of education or total education uh, for the human beings. Uh, it's a very traditional definition of uh, uh, the, the whole of formation uh, human beings can have uh, in, in, the, in the Greek tradition. But we wanted to subvert this. Now we 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 we'd like to 
to to to to give a little diversity to this idea and st and still have this strange word to mark our the name of our podcast. So we put it in a plural, ideas, uh, as we think there are uh, several ways of talking about education and doing education, uh, especially through media and other aspects of uh, society. Uh, we're all learning through the arts, uh, through our experience uh, in the day-by-day -day life. Uh, so that was uh, briefly our main uh, choice for uh, the name, Radio Paideas, with this Greek uh, word paideia in plural. So uh, due to the to the still small size of our team, we do not have a financing structure at uh, the university other than scholarships for undergraduate students at the university and the project ends up, and that's uh, what I find interesting about this work with students and scholarship, uh, the project ends up acquiring much of this identity of the students and relying on this experience of the students. So we can say that they they make the the the, the episodes, they 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 construct everything. Of course, we have uh, production um, uh, production um, stages, but they are contributing at all levels of uh, the production. Uh, both for editing uh, with students from the School of Edu Communication or even students from the School of Fine Arts uh, at the Federal University of Rio that are working with us uh, as scholarships uh, who have already worked on remodeling our visual identity and design. So since uh, last year, we have also been working with research linked to the interface between the humanities and scientific communication. That's one of my main topics of research as a researcher in the field of science communication uh, in Brazil. So given my work in this field, I am interested in promoting experiences that go beyond the traditional framework of scientific communication, science communication, approaching the more critical um, critical ways of, uh, of, of dealing with topics, perceiving science not as a provider of truths about the world uh, and the real, but precisely uh, pointing out complex elements in its construction, uh, uh, gathering the complex elements, uh, historical elements, and that's why uh, the focus on humanities and science communication. Uh, we wanted to, to focus on uh, the science communication of the humanities, and that's been a challenge, uh, the challenge that we uh, uh, started uh, uh, last year, so we're facing a lot of uh, interesting uh, paths throughout this discovery. So I wanted to, uh, with this podcast project, I wanted to perhaps uh, uh, resonate uh, a positive answer to what Isabel Stanger, this philosopher, uh, this Belgian philosopher, uh, posed uh, in the title of uh, one of her uh, last books. Uh, is another science possible? Another science is possible. Maybe we think with the podcast, with the media and gathering complex uh, uh, fields of action in society, uh, maybe perhaps we can construct, we can and have as a project or as an extension project, these, uh, these, uh, this kind of approach. So I won't, uh, I, I will leave now uh, open for the, the public. Perhaps it's the time for opening to the public. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I ask, that's it. And, and so I pass it through you. And I'm. Uh, that's what I, all I had to say. Thanks a lot and pleasure to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gabriel. So, um, so Lisa and I are going to sort of share the work of just facilitating an open discussion at this point. And I see Milan already made this point about given it's a wonderful turnout. So probably folks are just going to have um, a short time to make comments. There's so many points raised here about collaboration within the university, collaboration across into other spaces, um, like Destry's point about like how audio creates emergent possibilities. So it's a ton of ways for the conversation to go. And I think folks should raise their hand and if they want to ask a question and I don't know, Lisa, do you want to be the chat person or do you want to be the hand calling person? <laughs> uh, sure, I can keep an eye on the chat as it we'll rolls. Do chat. OK, awesome. Cool. Well, do you want to start us off with something from the chat while we're, people are waiting? Because I don't see any hands up yet. So, uh, well, there is um, a question here from Armand uh, asking if podcasts are not financed by universities, how are they funded? 
Does anyone want to take that? I can I can talk a little about our experience here in Brazil. Uh, we have uh, several uh, calls, uh, government calls uh, related to uh, the, uh, calls. Uh, uh, I don't know how we say this. This this public calls by the government, uh, by the Ministry of Science and uh, and Communication, and or the Ministry of Education that does regularly open calls and also private companies or corporations that uh, like to fund science communication, perhaps uh, in this field. There is a broad company here in Brazil that uh, started to finance podcast, Instituto Serra Pileira, and uh, they are financing uh, uh, now big projects uh, throughout the, the podosphere in Brazil. Uh, 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 they are producers who worked in university podcasts, uh, productions, and now they are um, um, uh, in, in big podcasts due to this financing uh, by this corporation, Serra Pileira, and also uh, projects uh, that are financed by uh, government institutions, especially science communication institutions and the government uh, policy, politics, uh, government policy for science communication and education. That's my experience here in Brazil regarding funding. Kara, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. I was telling me you had to unmute me. So can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, I did have a question, but in terms of funding, I, I actually wanted to answer that too. State humanities organizations, I think, is an excellent source of funding, and they're often looking for collaborations between academics and nonprofit institutions. And the projects I've worked on have all been funded uh, by those kinds of organizations. So, um, but my question is, because I'm a public historian, so most of my podcasting work, I've worked on kind of regional history podcasts in the Midwest. The audience is not other scholars. It's really sort of a general public. And so I'm, I'm wondering, and I'm new to the Humanities Podcast Network, I'm, I'm wondering sort of what, what everyone thinks about who the, the audience is for, for these kinds of podcasts. And is it just sort of other scholarships? Is this just an audio format for sharing academic scholarship? Or is there maybe a broader opportunity to sort of, to convey uh, humanities scholarship to a more sort of general, generally interested public? That's my question. I, I can give two uh, examples of different kinds of audiences. Uh, so John and I um, used to host our podcast um, novel dialogue, a, um, a uh, I don't know what the name would be for it, but the, the New Books Network is a collection of scholarly podcasts, and it gathers together both in-house production podcasts, but then also scholarly partners, which is what we are with New Books Network. And that is um, that audience, which is very large, um, because there are an extraordinary number of episodes and and um, and partner podcasts. Is I would say predominantly um, scholars, but um, crosses a lot of different kinds of audiences for people who are looking for a slightly kind of toned up intellectual conversation, even if it's you know about a subject matter that they are not an expert in. And then I would say um, that, you know, I have a, a literary interview podcast that has uh, taken me a very long time to develop an audience for and now has a sort of moderate audience. Um, but that's, I find, a harder audience to come by simply because you have to compete with lots of other kinds of professionally produced podcasts that are better at marketing and things like that. So I would say that Actually, the scholarly audience is sort of easier to to loop into, um, but that development of an audience for um, for a cross um, you know scholarly to non scholarly population takes a lot of time and is something that I I feel like this um, group of people is probably good at giving advice for how are the ways you can start to build that audience. I'm sure others can say more about this. Trudy, do you want to? 
Yeah, I thought we could speak about this because our part when we started our podcast, one of the big things was the audience for us. And I'll also say that for the funding um thing, both of our seasons are funded by Humanities New York. The first one was the Public Humanities Grant that like grad students can apply to. And then the Action Grant is what funds our second um season, which is slightly bigger and broader in its scopes and um, goals, I guess. Uh, but coming back to the audience, um, for us, when we started thinking even about a public humanities project, the goal was actually to reach beyond academic audiences. That was our first um, goal was to be able to reach community members here in the Broome County area and the state of New York in general. So even though it was outside the university, I guess we were limiting ourselves to thinking about the community here. But of course, everywhere it's a podcast, so everybody listens to it. Um, and Partnering with the Tenement Museum and American Civic Association has been helpful in being able to reach out to communities that are outside the university space as well, and also um, Binghamton University's IASH. But I also wanted to say that the other podcast that IASH does, Confluence, is specifically targeted towards grad students and faculty who want to kind of learn more about other public humanities projects that target audiences that are not faculty and grad students. So I guess it's scaffolded um, in that podcast, as opposed to ours, which is Immigrants Wake America. And I want to add a tiny angle to that as well, which comes up with, like the point that Gabriel was talking about, like partnering you know, with undergraduates. I bet we've all had experiences of working sort of across um, levels in the education, I think, so in the educational space. And I think that one thing that's exciting, apart from the developing the audience question, is like the developing the group question. So Beth Kramer, for example, in the Humanities Podcast Network has written a wonderful manual about teaching with podcasts, so that just the fact of making it is a form of intellectual growth. Even if you reach only a small audience, the people who are doing it, it it's incredibly empowering for, can be empowering for those for those folks. Uh, there were just uh, some participants who were wondering if Kara could drop in a few of those uh, local agencies that she was thinking of in the chat. Thank you. I also see a question that Destry, it seems like it's most directly related to your point, but about the unique affordances of the audio medium for scholarship. Maybe other folks have things to say about that as well. Well, I can say I'm at the still at the beginning of this process. So maybe I should come back in a year and let you all know how it's gone. But so far, what I have found is um, it has given me the opportunity to interview people about my topic, not just scholars or authors, but actual people who could be conceived of as audience members um, about the kinds of questions that I am grappling with in the dissertation and how it's affecting their lives personally. So that piece of it, I think more directly answers the question of why the research is relevant or why it matters. Um, that The answer to that question is baked into the podcast, by virtue of the presence of the people who are being interviewed. Um, and I have the opportunity to incorporate them making points that I am making in my dissertation in writing, but it's coming from someone else's um, voice and it's coming in their words. So that seems valuable. Um, absolutely the um, accessibility of it in that it's much more digestible, it's shorter. Um, part of the reason that I think the proposal for this podcast was interesting to the funding agency was that it was a way of disseminating my disseminating my podcast research to a broader audience to people outside of academia. Um, part of their goal in this and offering this fellowship was to try to keep keep the humanities relevant. Um, I'm sure we all don't need to be convinced that it's relevant, but maybe for a broader audience. Um, and I have found personally for myself that I am more willing to incorporate my own personal experience or my own personal voice into the podcast medium more so than in the dissertation. Um, and I could do some of my own thinking about why that is, but for me, for whatever reason, the um, 
auditory nature, the spoken nature of the podcast makes me more willing to um, include more of myself. And I think there's some value in that as well. Milan. I wanted to continue this conversation about the, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the unique uh, affordances of audio for scholarship and to think a bit about guests on podcasts. So um, the first con podcast that um, I produced was How to Read. That was accessible 15 minute bite-sized conversations with different scholars talking about their work in progress. And I think for these one-off guests, there's also a real value in the podcast medium, um, especially, you know, working together with hosts and producers who are experienced in making accessible podcasts. Um, I think we can push those guests to express themselves in ways that they wouldn't necessarily like at, a, at an academic conference or even talking with students. Um, and one thing in particular that I love is moments in a conversation where a scholar who has written an entire book about a topic says has a moment where they're like oh I've never thought about it that way before but now you mention it here's what that's making me think to hear a scholar who's an expert on a topic thinking out loud rethinking their existing ideas I think that's incredibly exciting and other than podcasts I don't think there's a place for that and yet it is a part of scholarship it's a part of thinking um so I wanted to add that to the conversation Le, did you want to um, I also wanted to add to um, in terms of affordances. So our podcast, like when we conceptualize our podcast, we conceptualize it as one that explores the very affordances of the medium in its engagement with stories of immigrant women recorded, unrecorded, or misrecorded in the archives. Um, so we we think that the form of the the podcast that has drawn our attention. Um, to the fact that the sonic variations in the voices of our storytellers are not just characteristics of the oral uh, storytelling or listening process, but are as much an essential essential part of the story itself. Um, so the epitomi epitomization of the racial difference and the subsequent uh, relegating of race to uh, to the visual domain is a common phenomena. Um, like Professor Jennifer Stover reminds us that far from being visions opposite, sound frequently appears to be visualities doppelganger in U.S. racial history, unacknowledged but ever present in the construction of race and the performance of racial oppression. And we keep that in mind while we produce the podcast. Lisa. Oh, just a, um, a quick addition. Uh, thinking about the afford affordances of the podcast and what Le has said and, and others, um, we get, you know, more of the vernacular uh, knowledge, the kind of knowledges that are, could be deeply informed by community assets, uh, which would include, you know, the kind of intimate stories, anecdotes that are deeply uh, revealing. We had uh, one guest who migrated from Uganda and she remigrated several times, which is actually a, a dimension of migration really is migrating several times. She goes to Uganda and Kenya, eventually to Canada, and then eventually to upstate New York. And the way she tells the story and her cadence, um, her accent, um, the anecdotes that she shared about her daughter, about the tradition of pet names, um, that in itself was just so um, impactful and is something that, you know, we, we couldn't get in, um, uh, let's say the traditional monograph. Um, so there are also more questions in the chat. Should I, should I, re okay. Um, there is a question about, um, Oh, they're just rolling in here. Okay, sorry. 
another one from okay joshua marsh um is wondering could you recommend what could you recommend for soliciting participants and getting started in the process to build capacity and sustainability of a podcast uh he's thinking of starting a podcast called docs talk that showcases the work of researchers in all academic fields. Would anyone like to tackle that one? I think the key part of the question is about how does one start soliciting participants for a podcast? I can say I helped to produce. Oh, John, do you want to go? No, no, go ahead, go, go. I'll just I can I'll just say that I um helped to produce a podcast that sounds very similar to this out of Columbia University. The dean of social studies there wanted to have a podcast where he featured the work of um, different members of the social sciences department. Um, so I can put it in the chat as an example. But he did it by starting with his own colleagues and essentially asking for a favor, and then. Um, once members of the faculty started listening and finding that it was really um, fun and a great way to showcase their work, then they started to vie to get on the show. And I was just gonna make the sort of obvious um, point that actually like a lot of docs really like talking. So I, I, we didn't actually find it that hard early on to get people to agree. I think the hardest part for us was um, finding a, com a comfortable conversational format and writing a ton of questions in advance and then using only a, a very tiny subset of the ones that we wrote. So I have, you know, long list of questions for Zadie Smith, who was like the third person I interviewed. And then, you know, a year later, I, I interviewed people with many fewer questions, but you know, so it just it's more about like the comfort of over preparing to get to the moment where you actually can, yeah, get to kind of what Chris was alluding to the the unexpected thought that comes up when they're being pushed to think about their ideas in a new context. Yeah, and if you're so I agree um, entirely with Destry and John that probably like colleague colleague first and then what magic is that once you have some guests on you get a network of people because guests will start to say you know who's fantastic on this subject is so and so and then you reach out and if you're dealing with academics um I mean, it's I, I it's very unlikely that they won't be interested, even if you know the particular time doesn't work for them. They'll do it at a different time, and you can reschedule. If you're looking for guests who are outside of academia and maybe harder sells, that is a sort of like building up of sort of credibility as a uh, as as a podcast, and you can do that through things that are um, more uh, surface, like having a website that looks sort of up to date and and reasonably professional so that someone can look at it and say oh this is this is a legitimate thing um but then you can also work through the various um you know the various inter um uh, you know, the various connections, everyone from agents to uh, background people at publishers, and they can start to kind of point you in the direction of, of folks and, and see if there's interest. But it, I think it is a building up of credibility over time that then allows guests to have an easy yes to you. But if it's just docs, um, I think you're going to be successful straight away, but you can start with that colleague and go from there. I, I think like my team will probably also want to add to this, but I feel like the question of how to get people on the podcast has been such a, mm. like, our podcast is driven by the storytellers who come on it. It's so little about us and so much about the people who are on it and working with the Tenement Museum and American Civic Association has been such a huge part of how we even think about the podcast. Um, Professor Yun had um, worked with the Tenement Museum before has been working with the museum for many years in her classes, her teaching and stuff. Um, when Le and I took a class in 2020 as grad students, um, we wanted to do something with this class and with the stuff that she'd 
um, introduced us to. So we started making topical collections and so on and so forth and came up with the idea, oh, why not call these people in these archives to actually tell their stories in their own voices, literally, and what better form than a podcast? So that's like how we got the story got got in touch with the storytellers for our first season these were people who had um sent in the stories of themselves their parents their grandmothers um in the tenement museums digital archives called your story our story and like we've said for this season we're working with um case workers at the american civic association who work with refugees um migrants and are themselves um uh, a lot of the times migrants and refugees um, so that's how we have been um, getting to our audience, I guess. Uh, I just wanted to add to what uh, Shudi just mentioned uh, in terms of our um, um, participants, the storytellers of a podcast. For the first season, we also um, have gone through several rounds of selecting and reaching out to the storytellers um like in the beginning we we picked lots of them and then uh, professor Ying and the uh, Catherine Lloyd uh, from the Tenement Museum they helped us reach out to the storytellers um but um some of them were not available or some of them uh, first decided to join and then said they cannot join us anymore and then we also had to um revise the theme of our podcast a little bit different episodes um and um so we also then had to choose different storytellers based on the theme we yeah we we went through different stages and eventually we had a group of storytellers settled for the first season and then when we interact with them uh, after the first rounds of interaction we had like casual like several rounds of carol meeting with them as well to get familiar with each other and uh, to they um and also we we did we want them to tell us what they want to share on the podcast in, instead of us telling them what we want to feature no they tell us what they want to share and we send them the draft of questions and then they will uh, edit the questions or delete some questions or add questions um, so yeah, for us, we are the facilitator of the whole process instead of um, the, yeah, we're, we're the facilitators and they are um, the, the hero of the show. Okay, there are more questions in the chat. Um, and this one is from Elizabeth Yang and it's about podcasts as valid forms of scholarship. Elizabeth would like to know, has there been a growing positive reception of uh, podcasts as serious scholarship by scholars in the academy? I don't think there has. I'm wondering if the silence is telling yeah. us. I really don't. And hearing these, you know, bo about these projects, you know, the, the specific like audio affordances and the specificity of recording voices and the sort of stories, it makes me more frustrated than ever that there hasn't been. But I do think there's a general discussion about public scholarship and how to accredit that. And that's clearly happening. But I think podcast specificity within that space has not been recognized. But I'd love to pe for people to disagree with me. So. I, I'll, I'll disagree. Um, oh, sorry, Shruti, go ahead. I, yeah, I don't have a disagreement as much as I just want to like share with you all an anecdote from our university here, from both the English department and the more writing initiative here. Um, so a couple of semesters ago, the first course on podcasting from the writing initiative was offered. At this point, there had been a couple of other courses from the cinema department. I'd offered a course on podcasting specifically before, but the writing initiative offered a course on podcasting, which was like getting a C credit for like a composition credit for podcasting. Um, sorry, there's something outside. Yeah. So one section with 15 people got filled in like a half a day. So the writing initiative decided to have a second section on this course. Second section, completely filled. They decided to have a third section on this course, completely filled. Four sections on podcasting as 
in in a composition department will run this semester and now this is a stable course in that in that department um even in the english department where i am right now every every summer there has been a full the class has been full when it comes to a course on podcasting that i've offered and i don't think that shows that podcasts are being treated seriously in the humanities as much as like podcasts seem to be thought of as a flashy way to deal with the infamous crisis in the humanities right now which i think is kind of like a bad thing than a good thing i don't know okay there's some um, another question from john barber does anyone here have experience, advice, wisdom, or thoughts about podcasts that do not include guests? I already said this in the chat, but I think Philosophize This, the podcast by Stephen West, does a really good job. Um, and uh, for perhaps Portuguese speakers, uh, we have a, a, an interesting uh, experience uh, blending research and podcasts uh, here in Brazil. It's a uh, I think you're muted. We can't hear you. Uh, sorry, I don't know how much you got, but we have here in Brazil this this experience, and we have uh, I can recall this experience here in Brazil. It's called Ser Sonoro, in which uh, a researcher tried to do exper experiments that he was developing in his PhD thesis and put it in a podcast. So maybe if, if you maybe if you don't uh, understand Portuguese, perhaps you can listen. They have a lot of what uh, people. Uh, Put in the chat also soundscapes that's a great podcast for you to use your phones and try to 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 delve in, in the in the where he creates but he's a researcher of sound and the, the expressions by sound so it's very interesting i'll put in the in the chat uh very briefly do we have time for one more question or I was gonna ask Milan and Kim the same question. Are we allowed one more? One more, okay. Okay, because this relates directly to what Gabrielle was uh, just saying. This is from Kim. Could folks share about their experiences with using non-vocal sound as a way of storytelling within a podcast? Maybe we can start again, just because La and I were like texting about a couple of instances of this in our podcast, actually, right now. Our first episode we recorded was with the, the Tenement Museum's director and Professor Yun together. Um, her name is Catherine Lloyd. Um, uh, in this in the episode, we discuss, of course, what the podcast is going to be about, but we also discuss Professor Yun's um, family's immigration story and stuff and her childhood. Um, and one of the things that she spoke about was where she lived and like the gravel road. Um, that was just a thing that you mentioned. But um, in a lot of the reception that we got from that episode, we added the sound of gravel or, or like a... a truck or a jeep moving on or car moving on the gravel road it was a distinct sound of the gravel road um and i think Claire will also say that she in another episode a, a, a storyteller spoke about her grandmother or something making pasta and so she added the sound of like the pasta stirring <laughs> and all, all of these things i think um are really important to us and we tend to um, experiment with them variously when we do the editing process. Yeah, in, in, in the episode that Shruti just mentioned, um, the storyteller was talking about the recipe, her grandma's, uh, Italian grandma's recipe. Um, so I added the sound of the, like the grandma, uh, added the sound of stirring the pasta sauce. Um, we got the feedback from the audience that they loved the like the texture, um, the additional non-vocal sound added to the story. Okay, so I think we could continue to talk about this for a whole other hour, um, but I'm going to stop us here. Um, 
uh, both so that people can look away from their screens. Also, I know that there are some watch parties happening. Yep. Hello to you if you're um, at a watch party. Thank you so much. Um, and hope you continue the discussion there.